Since their arrival in Osaka last Thursday, the Prince and Princess of Wales have been most honoured guests of the Japanese people. Royal tourists in a land steeped with centuries-old customs and traditions which live easily side by side with 20th century technology. Their obvious delight with the country, its culture and its people has been captured by a BBC news team whose colourful documentary of the Royal Tour, Most Honoured Guests, is tomorrow at 8.30 BBC One. With surgical precision on BBC Two in a minute, MASH celebrates Christmas. While in half an hour we attempt to reconstruct QED's body out of the bog, the ancient Lindo man. This is BBC One. The nine o'clock news from the BBC with Julia Somerville and John Humphreys. British shipyards under the axe. Three are to shut, three and a half thousand jobs to go. Gorbachev's offer to Reagan, I'll stop nuclear tests, you meet me in Europe. How a boat, 15 years old, caused a nuclear alert at Hinkley Point. And the cancer victim who put his life into a play. Good evening. As expected, British shipbuilders have announced huge redundancies. Three and a half thousand workers are to lose their jobs by the end of the year. Three yards are to close completely. The blow has fallen on yards in the heartland of Britain's traditional merchant shipbuilding industry, on the Tyne, the Tees and the Clyde. British shipbuilders say they're desperately short of orders because of a worldwide slump in the industry. The axe has fallen in areas of the country which are already some of the worst unemployment black spots. Nearly 1,300 jobs go in Middlesbrough, where unemployment already stands at almost 23%. 925 jobs go in Sunderland, where unemployment is over 20%. 360 in nearby Wall's End. On Clydeside, nearly 500 jobs go at governed shipbuilders, in a region where approaching 20% are already without work, and 325 from the Troon Yard. And finally, in the southwest, 95 jobs go at the Appledore Yard in North Devon, an area where nearly 15% are without work. Union leaders know shipbuilding's always been a game of boom and bust, and they recognise a slump when they see one. But once a yard closes, it's gone for good, and they'll fight that. We're saying now, enough's enough. This, to me, seems to bring about the death knell of merchant shipbuilding as we know it in this country. It's been our views now for some considerable time, but this has put the nail in the coffin. We are desperately short of work within the industry. And in fact, in practical terms, we've probably only got about eight months' work for the industry as a whole. And some of the yards are due to run out of work in June of this year. The demand for merchant ships has collapsed all around the world. Back in the boom of 1973, 130 million tonnes were on order. Of that, Britain had about 7 million tonnes. Today, the world order book is down by three quarters, and Britain's merchant yards are almost empty. Even the once dominant Japanese have been forced to close capacity and lay off shipyard workers. But their great rivals in the Far East, Korea, have simply become more aggressive, cutting costs so ferociously that no Western competitor can live with them. Last year, British shipbuilders quoted £14 million for a new lighthouse ship. After a government subsidy, that price came down to £12.5 million. But the South Korean company Hyundai quoted just £9.5 million, £3 million cheaper than British shipbuilders. The Koreans got the job. It is a very serious situation. All over the world, shipbuilding industries are contracting. Even the Japanese have laid off 10,000 people. The Koreans are shutting down, not shutting, getting less. The French, the Germans, the Dutch, the Swedes have completely closed down, one of the most modern merchant shipbuilding industries in the world. It is a very, very serious matter. He did not announce today one single initiative or proposal which would help the British shipbuilding industry survive. And what he produced instead was a series of pieces of sticking plaster to try and cover over the gaping wounds that have been left uh, by these decisions. Uh, and they are irrelevant to the main heart of the problem. Tonight, British shipbuilders can look enviously at the money-making warship yards 
they once owned, now hived off to the private sector. Without them, the state-owned business has been swimming against the tide, and many fear that before too long, it will go under completely. The government is giving £10 million to the areas worst hit by the job losses. £5 million will be used to set up a subsidiary of British shipbuilders to help redundant workers retrain and find new jobs. There'll also be more money for the Manpower Services Commission and for local job creation. But that won't satisfy the people involved. The answer from the North East tonight was defiant. Union leaders say they'll be working out details of a campaign to oppose the redundancies during the next week. There are fears that the Clark Kincaid engine works, British shipbuilders' last yard on the Tyne, may now be sold off. The reaction at Troon in southwest Scotland was one of shock. They've had a shipyard for a hundred years and now it's to close. Some workers are talking of... At Govan on Clydeside, the picture's almost as bleak. After this ferry's completed, there are no firm orders. The yard at Appledore in Devon escaped with the smallest number of redundancies, just 95. And there's some relief there that it could have been a lot worse. But without doubt, the worst hit yard is Smith's Dock at Middlesbrough, where nearly 1,300 jobs are to go. It's yet another blow to a community that's already suffering high levels of unemployment. South Bank, Teesside, and Smith's Dock. It's not just part of the landscape, it's part of most people's lives hereabouts. News of the closure came at noon. A lack of orders was to blame. First reactions were most telling. You know, sort of a bombshell, really, you know. Should have been told earlier, I think. But uh, just how it goes, isn't it? It's going to be one hard struggle to try and make ends meet just to um, get by, really. Unemployment in the surrounding area is high, well above the national average. In some streets, every householder is out of work. Now, it's to get worse. At her corner shop in Victoria Street, Nancy Vickers has had enough. She's selling up. Her father and four brothers all worked at Smith's Dock. Well, I think it's disastrous. Absolutely. I mean, my father was one of the first ones to start in Smith's Docks. And uh, he was there for over 40 years. He loved to get up and go to work. That's all I thought about, the like to drink of beer. I mean, if a man's got a pound in his pocket to spare, he never deprived my mother of it. And there was a big family of us. And he went to work with broken ribs and three broken fingers. He wouldn't stay off work. He was a worker. Like all of them now that are dead, they were workers in them days. Some may be old enough to reminisce, close to retirement. But the younger ones have their future, which couldn't be more uncertain. David Powell is 25, a welder at Smith's Dock, born and raised in South Bank. He has a £12,000 mortgage, a wife, Angela, and nine-month-old baby, Daniel. Well, I'm going to I'm gonna have to really find work to look after the wife and Burnley. But getting a job's going to be hard. We may have to move, yeah, in the long run, because there's not, not a lot going around here at the moment. The steel works are closing down and all. Around South Bank, despite the ad man's encouragement hardly appropriate today, there are signs of people turning their backs on the only community they've ever known. Tonight, the mood here, as you'd expect, is a mixture of anger and despair, but not surprise, because the warning signs of falling orders have been there for some time. The anger comes because no one, no one that is in the South, in Whitehall, did anything about it. The workforce argue that had the government shown the industry more support, there just might have been the chance of a reprieve, of fighting for what orders there are in the world's shrinking shipbuilding industry. John Harrison. The Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev, has spoken on television about the Chernobyl disaster. The worst is behind us, he said, but it's too early to know what caused the accident. He gave new casualty figures. 299 people went to hospital suffering from radiation sickness. Of those, seven have died. The Soviet leader proposed more international cooperation to deal with the problems of nuclear power. He announced that the Soviet Union was extending its nuclear test ban until August the 6th, the anniversary of Hiroshima. And he invited President Reagan for talks about a permanent test ban anywhere in Europe. Mr. Gorbachev said the accident at Chernobyl had pointed up the dangers of nuclear technology. He said it shows us the abyss that would open up if nuclear war were ever to break out.
Я подтверждаю свое предложение президенту Рейгану встретиться безотлагательно в столице любого европейского государства, которое будет готово нас принять, или, скажем, в Хиросиме, и договориться о запрете ядерных испытаний. The accident had upset him deeply, he said, but the damage would have been so much greater had it not been for the courage of the Soviet people. Благодаря принятым эффективным мерам сегодня можно сказать, худшее позади. Наиболее серьезные последствия удалось предотвратить. Конечно, под случившимся рано подводить черту. Нельзя успокаиваться. Впереди еще большая продолжительная работа. Уровень радиации в зоне станции и на, не, э, на непосредственно прилегающей к ней территории сейчас еще остается опасным для здоровья людей. Поэтому первоочередной задачей на сегодняшний день являются работы по ликвидации последствий аварии. Well, Obviously, the speech was intended to reassure the Soviet people about the effects of Chernobyl. Do you think that um, he succeeded? Well, he wore his gravest manner and he told them that the worst was over. So to that extent, yes. One thing it will have done, though, is it will have driven home how important, how dangerous this accident was. Because for uh, Mr. Gorbachev to come and devote a complete speech to this subject and to take the beginning of the national news to do it, uh, is a very rare thing indeed and means that uh, the, the public will be aware just how serious it was now. But people do now accept that the worst is behind them, to use Mr. Gorbachev's phrase. I think the fact that Mr. Gorbachev himself has appeared on television to say that means that he will be completely believed. He has enormous personal prestige here. The average Soviet citizen looks to Mr. Gorbachev to lead his country forward from a rather dead era of the last ten years or so and uh, that's the prestige he's put behind this. On the extension to the nuclear test ban, Brian, what's Mr. Gorbachev trying to do there? Persuade the Americans to go along with him? Because he's tried that in the past and it's failed, hasn't it? Yes, the Americans have made it very clear that they are not going to be swayed by moratoriums announced by the Soviet Union. They've also thrown out the idea of Mr. Reagan coming to Europe to, uh, to, to meet Mr. Gorbachev to talk about this one issue. Both have been kicked firmly out and they must be a dead duck. So it's very hard to see uh, why Mr. Gorbachev should think that he could get anything other than publicity from repeating this. Brian Hanrahan in Moscow, many thanks. A nuclear reactor at the Sizewall A power station in Suffolk was shut down today when a fault was discovered. It was being brought back into service after maintenance. Some radioactivity was released. Small, it wouldn't have had to be reported to the government under existing rules. Last November's accident at Hinkley Point B nuclear power station in Somerset, which led to a major alert, was caused by a single faulty bolt. Several tons of radioactive gas leaked out and 500 workers were evacuated, but after an investigation, the Central Electricity Generating Board said today there had never been any danger to either staff or the public. It had been the most serious accident in the Somerset nuclear plant's 10-year history. Eight tons of radioactive carbon dioxide leaking for four hours. As 500 workers were evacuated, potassium iodate tablets were issued for the first time in Britain against the risk of radiation. Today, the inquiry disclosed a quarter-inch diameter nut and bolt had fallen out, loosing a steel shaft that was blown out under pressure. A washer costing a few pence hadn't been fitted properly. The full report into the accident won't be published, only its summary and conclusions, a decision that has infuriated the local Liberal MP, Paddy Ashdown. He said there will never be public support for nuclear power in the face of such secrecy. To be certain that we get the full facts, we need the entire confidence of our staff. They must feel free to tell us the whole truth and nothing but the truth. To ask them to do that against the background, the possibility of all their confidential remarks being published in full really wouldn't be fair. The CEGB now says they'll be checking all their nuclear reactors to make sure similar faults can't happen again. Two more British women are to become surrogate mothers. The babies will be born in December. The women are carrying the babies for two childless couples arranged through an agency in Wales. The agency says it's found a way around the ban on commercial surrogacy introduced after the birth of baby Cotton, Britain's first known commercial surrogate baby. 
Lorian Finlay runs her surrogate agency from deepest Wales. Apart from the two women already pregnant, she says she has matched five more British couples with American women who will bear a child for them. She avoids prosecution by exploiting a loophole in the law. Surrogate mothers, women who have a baby and then give it up, are not paid for the baby. That's against...